when expected frequencies in a contingency table are small, you cannot use a chi-squared test for independence. However, in case of a 2x2 two two table, there's an alternative test that is designed for small samples. It's called Fisher's exact test. In this video, I'll explain how it works. Fisher's exact test takes the count in a single cell as test statistic. And you can then formulate the null hypothesis that this observed count is equal to its expected count versus the alternative that it's unequal. When using a two-sided hypothesis, Fisher's exact test is equal to the chi-square test for independence. And you could alternatively state as null hypothesis that the variables are independent. You can, in Fisher's exact test, however, also formulate one-sided hypothesis to test whether the observed count in a cell is higher or equal, and also that it's lower or equal than the expected value. But in general, you should have a very good reason to conduct a one-sided test and use a two-sided test as the default. It's time for an example. Let's assume you've done a small survey interviewing persons who just visited a museum. You sampled a modern and a classical arts museum respectively. And checked whether besides visiting the museum, they bought something in the museum shop as well. The underlying question is whether there is a fixed rate of museum visitors who buy something in a museum shop, or whether this varies per type of museum. An answer to this question would not tell why such a relationship would exist but that would be a next step in your research. These are your results. The total counts of the two musea were 22 and 4, and for buying something, 9 and 17. Now, the idea of the test is that, given the marginal distributions, there are a limited number of arrangements possible in the table. For example, instead of a count of 8 and 14 in the first row, we could also have a count of 9 and 13, while in the second row the counts would then change to 0 and 4 to keep the marginal frequencies the same. By making all possible rearrangements, you can make a probability distribution of all possible values in a given cell, and then compare how extreme your observed frequency is in this distribution. Let's see how this works. We take the upper left cell with a count of 8 as test statistic. Let's start with the change that we just made. The upper left cell was increased to 9 by moving one count from the right to the left. At the same time, at the second row, the count had to move from the left to the right to keep the marginal distribution the same. We cannot increment this upper left cell any further, because at the lower row we cannot move any count from the left to the right anymore. So let's decrease the value at the upper left cell from 8 to 7. Now the values at the lower row become 2 and 2. And we go on by decreasing the upper left value to 6. Now the lower row becomes 3 and 1. And finally we decrease the upper left to 5, so that in the lower row we have 4 and 0. Again we reach the limit. There are in total only 5 possible configurations given these marginal values. They are shown here for decreasing values of the upper left cell. The question now is, how many combinations are possible within each configuration? Fortunately, there is an equation to calculate it. Here it is. It gives the probability that this specific configuration in a 2x2 two two table occurs. In the numerator, all factorials of the marginal frequencies are multiplied. And in the denominator, all factorials of the joint frequencies, as well as the factorial of the total sample size. That's a lot of multiplication. But a computer can do the work for us. And these are the probabilities for the five different configurations. Here's a more compact list, where we show only the count in the upper left cell with the corresponding probabilities. Now the answer to our question is found by looking up how probable the particular count is that we got, a value of 8. It has a probability of 0.41. So the null hypothesis of independence is not rejected. As you can see, 
only in the case where the cell value would have been 5, we would have rejected the null hypothesis at the 5% significance level. As a final note, I would like to mention that the general method for Fisher's exact test can in fact be applied to larger tables. The general approach and the interpretation of the results is exactly the same. However, calculating the probability of a specific configuration gets complex and may also become difficult to compute if sample sizes get too large. But then, in such situations, the data set would meet the requirements for a chi-square test. Let me summarize what I explained in this video. If you have two binary categorical variables with a small sample, you can apply Fisher's exact test. The null hypothesis in this test is that the count for a specific cell is not different from its expected value which is equivalent to stating that the two variables are independent. If there is a good reason to do so, a directional null hypothesis can also be formulated. The count in a single cell is used as test statistic and its probability is calculated with this equation. If this probability is lower than the chosen significance level, for instance 0.05, the null hypothesis of independence is rejected.